Good evening, everybody. Thank you for uh, joining us. Okay. Uh, so we've really based our plan around three main things, the three things that uh, are, are known to be the best way to prevent um, the spread of infection, or the transmission of the virus. Uh, you know, our goal is to make it as difficult as possible for the, anyone to get infected while on our campus. We know we can't control people's behavior off our campus, um, and we expect that all our community members will do all things that they should, but we're really focusing on behavior on campus. Uh, and those three things are the wearing of face masks, uh, maintaining physical distancing, and the frequent washing of hands. So that's the heart of our plan. I'll go through those uh, in a minute and some other things as well. But our main instruction with students will be around these three things as well as our procedures. And they really are the highlight of our, um, of our expectations. So we are still setting up the campus. So this is just a, a shot to give you a sense. We've taken out a lot of chairs and desks so that um, they can be six feet apart. Uh, those locations will get marked on the floor so the desks stay there. You don't see in this picture the teacher's desk that will also have a shield and um, there'll be a mark to make sure that students are at least six feet away from, um, from the teachers. Uh, this is, some of our rooms have tables. Some of those rooms, the tables have been replaced by desks, but in places where that's not really feasible, um, we have plexiglass barriers. It's a little hard to see, but that barrier is higher than the wood you see. It's about twice as high, so it, it'll be up over um, students' heads. Uh, this is Debbie's desk, our front reception, uh, also with a plexiglass barrier. These were built in the fabrication lab at the Blue Hill Consolidated School by Matt Jurek and GSA alum Ben Polite. And here's this is only about half of the stuff. So the student council is gonna be coming in this week to help us assemble all these and get them to the right places. Uh, and also to help us with marking our campus, the hallways, we'll have one way lanes, um, six foot intervals and places where students might congregate like entrances to the building, et cetera. Um, and uh, in the academy house, so that people have good, clear indicators of six feet. This is just to see, again, we're in the midst of setting rooms up, but these are uh, ventilation fans. The blue things are uh, HEPA filter air purifiers that will go in every room. And this is a couple of the hand sanitizing stations that uh, I wish there'll be many around campus uh, at the entrances and in every room, although not every place will have these. Some will have them attached to the walls. Um, so the next thing is enhanced cleaning, cleaning protocols. I talked about that a little bit. Uh, we'll be, you know, normally the school gets a good cleaning uh, once a day in the afternoons and evenings. Uh, we will doing, be doing more cleaning during the day of high touch areas uh, and um, any shared items in classrooms, including the desks, will be cleaned and disinfected in between each class. Uh, teachers will have a place for students to put their work that they need to hand in, or teachers can put work to get handed back uh, so that, again, teachers can't be closer than six feet uh, to their students without extra protective equipment. So that's how we'll do that part. And then uh, it's required that everyone, so the adults as well as the students, do a daily symptom check as well as any other risk factors, like have you been around someone who's tested positive uh, for COVID-19. So we will be using a uh, smartphone app to do that. It should be very convenient. You'll get a reminder each morning uh, to do it, and then that will send that information in, and we can see very quickly if everyone has done it or not, and also if anyone answered yes to any of the questions. And if they do, it'll say, don't come to school, contact the school nurse. So we'll reach out to those people and figure out what's the appropriate next step, depending on what the situation was. Um, if anyone comes to school and hasn't filled this out, they can't stay at school and will need to go home. 
Uh, in all things, we're following the CDC, Maine CDC, and uh, the federal CDC, as well as Maine Department of Education guidelines, and we will continue to do that. So there's a difference between what might happen with a suspected case or a confirmed case. Uh, in each situation, though, we will reach out immediately to get guidance from the CDC, and they will tell us both what we should do next as a community and um, what we should advise the, the student or the adult that they should do next. Um, and if a student needs to stay home, if they're not too ill to do schoolwork, so they may be staying home just because they had a fever and they're actually not incapacitated, they can continue their work remotely. Uh, but no one, a student or an adult, will be able to come back unless they've been medically cleared, which means that um, that would be through our nurse and through uh, personal physicians. So here's the schedule. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday are the same. Uh, you see again, you, everyone must do pre-screening before they come. That includes not just coming on campus, but getting on the school bus if you ride the bus. Uh, our first bus typically comes around 715, at least in other years. And so at that point, we will need to open up our buildings, but they won't be open before. And then until 745, any students who are here early will need to go to the gym and um, the bleachers will be out and they'll be marked in six foot intervals and students can stay there. At 745, uh, they can go to their classrooms and any student who comes after 745 would go directly to their um, first period class. And then you'll see in our block schedule, we have longer periods, period one, and then advisory period after that each day. That's for both the check-in and some house cleaning things. And also we just know that even though I do believe things will go smoothly and um, we'll hit an equilibrium, there's still gonna be more stresses and strains on students and we wanna give them frequent opportunity to check in with their advisors. Then there's period two. Period three you'll see is longer because we'll be serving lunch during period three. I'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. And then period four. Uh, on Wednesdays, no students will come to campus. It'll be 100% remote. This enables us to do a couple of things. One, to do a more thorough cleaning in the middle of the day between when group A is here and group B. It also is a chance for all the students in period one to be together since they'll be split in half in terms of who's on campus. So we'll run a regular class schedule and these classes will be, um, uh, will be Zoomed and uh, everyone will be there for that. We'll start the day with a longer advisory period, which is what we always had on Wednesdays. Uh, honestly, I'm not sure what to do about community meetings. We certainly can't have them here on campus. I don't know how great they are going to be on Zoom, but we need to think about how we continue to have some community events to, get, to uh, keep our sense of being a single community. Um, and whatever we do would happen in that first half an hour. And then you'll see at the end of the day, these periods are shorter. Uh, it's very hard to imagine a productive 80 minute virtual class. So by design, they're 50 minutes. Um, and that also gives us a chance at the end of the day for teacher office hours, most particularly for any students who are 100% remote. So they can um, know they can connect with their teacher then, but other students could as well. And the teacher may say, hey, Tim, I need you to check in with me this afternoon, you know, next Wednesday afternoon during my office hours. Um, that, there we go. So a typical school day, again, before coming, everyone must do the screening. There'll be more information coming your way, including what the app is. It will be free for uh, parents, but you will need to download it on your, um, on your phone. Uh, and uh, we'll get to the information on how that will work. And I went through a little bit. Buildings won't open until about 7.15, go to the gym first. And then we'll have a different door for each grade so that there's lessens the likelihood that students will back up at the doors. And if you remember from the first slide, all students, everyone really has to wash or dis disinfect their hands when they come to campus. So we'll have a couple of stations at each of those doors to facilitate students um, coming in smoothly. 
And um, if you have your first period in, in one of the other buildings, if it's after 745, students should just go right there. And again, there'll be disinfecting stations at the entrance to them. So one thing that's different from other years is in the past, 12th graders who had a free period first period or a free period last period um, did not have to be on campus. Uh, this year, in order to help keep numbers down as much as possible, we're extending that to 11th graders as well. So um, an 11th grader or a 12th grader who has a first period free does not need to come in until the advisory period, which is required. And they could leave period four uh, when their academic day is done. And then the end of the school day, as I said, 11th and 12th graders can leave. School day ends at 2.30. And in the past, we have allowed students to kind of hang out around campus, um, but we can't do that anymore. So at the end of the day, we'll need to go and, um, and we'll, lock up, we'll lock up the doors. So, <clears throat> Lunch will be in the classrooms during third period, which has been extended by 30 minutes. Um, students will have a chance to order lunch if they'd like to get it from GSA in their advisory period, and it will be delivered to their classrooms. So no one's gonna be able to walk into the cafeteria and order or pick up uh, a lunch because physical distancing will not allow that. Uh, they can certainly bring their own lunch um, we will not be having microwaves in every single classroom, so they ought not bring something that needs to be heated up. Uh, we are no longer allowing students to go to Maryland Hinckley during the day, so that was something during break and at lunch they used to be able to do, but it's just not feasible given all the things that we're trying to do, and I've spoken with John Bannister and we're agreed that it just doesn't make sense. So during the day, students will not be able to go to Maryland Hinckley. Uh, but since we don't have a break in the class day anymore, we will now allow students to eat a snack in their classrooms so they can bring food and uh, it will be up to the teacher when there'll be a, a, a break to eat snacks. Anytime someone's in the building, except when they're eating or drinking, they need to wear a mask. And uh, we understand that this takes getting used to. And it's never going to be like not wearing a mask. So I've instructed teachers that they can take as many, let's go outside and stay six feet apart, but take our masks off as they need so that it does not become too, um, too uncomfortable. And likewise, it'll be up to teachers to say, okay, let's take a quick break and you can have a snack um, whenever it seems appropriate. Uh, for lunch, when the weather's nice, we will be encouraging people to take their classes outside. And we'll have a lot more trash in the classroom, so we will have extra trash cans and we have a system for picking them up. Uh, our water fountains are turned off for drinking. They're only, you can only use them now for filling a water bottle. So we're asking that students bring a couple of water bottles each day and they should be filled. They, they could have a chance to fill them up um, during passing time or something, but um, the water fountains no longer are, I guess what used to be called bubblers within the little stream of water. So we felt like each grade needed to come by itself, both to go over all our procedures and also since all the grades are split to have, um, to have a day to start the year when they're all together. Obviously they can't all be together in their classes and it can't all be together in the auditorium so we still have to make some adjustments from things we might do but they will have a chance to be on campus together uh, because ninth graders are new to high school we felt that having two orientation days rather than a normal one for them was important so friday the fourth they'll be the first students who come to campus and they'll have an orientation day that's much like what we used to do in their advisories getting to know each other getting to know the campus and then their second one on Friday will be um, a little bit more geared towards meeting their teachers and um, continuing to go over our procedures and protocols uh, on how to use our new online learning system, et cetera. And that will be for the 12th through 11th grade, sorry, 12th through 10th graders. That's what they'll be doing on their days when they're here. Uh, 
spend some time together in their advisories, um, go over all our pr protocols, procedures, do some training on hand washing and mask wearing and physical distancing, and um, some work getting them up to speed on Canvas. And then the following Monday, the 14th, we will start our hybrid model. Monday and Tuesday, everyone remote on Wednesday, and then the second group Thursday and Friday. So if you're in group A, you get your course content Monday and Tuesday, and then are sent off with um, things to do Thursday and Friday, and you'll have class on Wednesday. So three days a week, all students will have class. Uh, if you're in group B, you will get your class content Thursday and Friday, and then Monday and Tuesday, well, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and Monday and Tuesday, you'll have your work that you're doing at home um, set up by your teacher. Uh, and the, um, obviously the first week, Group B doesn't have much to do on Monday and Tuesday, but after that, uh, it should move forward smoothly. Uh, I do believe that having Canvas as a single platform for all students to use, it's a pretty powerful one. Uh, and the fact that students will have three classes a week with their teacher, including two when they're in the classroom, will make the at-home portion markedly different from um, in the spring when we didn't have any of those things in place. So it still is not going to be exactly the same, but I do think that um, students will have a good academic experience. Okay, so will Zoom classes be recorded and available after the fact? Um, we are not doing that, and the reason is, there's a couple of reasons, but one is a lot of class is, doesn't, if you're not there, it won't make a lot of sense. So teachers will, will um, have other ways of delivering content, including they may record themselves for students who are 100% remote, but for students who are in the hybrid model, what happens on the two days they're not there is the same as what happens the two days they are there. So um, for them, it doesn't really make sense to see a recording of those, um, a recording of those classes. Um, if it hasn't already, um, something will be going out very soon about the 100% remote, um, remote piece. Uh, David, do you want to add anything to that? I know I'm sort of throwing that at you out of the blue. Um, there, there will be some individual teachers who will be doing some recording um, through Canvas. There's a capacity for teachers to record videos, um, which then can be shared that students can watch it every time but at any time, but I think that would be more likely for them to be recording explanations and lectures rather than like live class time. Right, thanks. So Rod, as, as long as the questions don't start to pile up, I'll just kind of work my way through them. And if, if it starts to get away from me, I'll um, turn to you. So um, should students be encouraged to take four courses each semester? Um, I think it really depends on your child. You know, the, the, the advantage of the block schedule is it reduces the number of classes that you're trying to keep up with and the number of teachers you're trying to keep up with. There are students who absolutely could handle four classes each semester, and there are other students for whom that may not be the best idea. So I think that's a good question to for your child to talk about with his or her advisor um, or you can um, uh, reach out to David at this point about what options are if you would like to if you would like to do that the one thing I would say is to remember that because the classes are in a single semester the workload for each is greater than it would be normally when you have a whole year to get through the material um, so those are things to those are things to keep in mind, but it's it's not certainly not forbidden, and that would be an individual choice. Uh, yes, yeah, students will get their laptops the first day of that they're here. So those grade level days, that's when they'll get them. For the ninth grade, it'll be the second one. Um, but for so by the end of that week, they will all have their um, their laptops. 
So the next question is about what happens if someone doesn't follow our protocols? So um, to me, there's a difference between You know, I have my mask on and it sort of slipped down. We say, hey, Tim, you need to pull your mask up. Or someone who just isn't wearing one or says, I don't want to wear one. So in the former, we would say, please pull your mask up. And uh, assuming that's a very isolated insulin, that's fine. But if a student says, I refuse to wear one or a parents say, we don't want our child to wear masks, then they will have to do their school remotely. It's just, it's an absolute requirement of being on our campus. Um, I don't anticipate a lot of problems, but one never knows. Most of our kids, I think, understand and they're cooperative, but it is an absolute requirement. And um, as is doing the pre-screening test every day, again, if someone forgets one day, okay, well, you can't come to school, but that's all right. But if, if, if it's frequent, then they'll have to go to the remote option. So a question about classroom conversations. The only day that, that group A and group B will have classroom conversations together is Wednesday. Um, that's part of the reason why we wanted to do Wednesday remote for everyone to have that possibility. Um, but other than that, except through Canvas and electronic chats and um, where students could all be together, addressing a topic, but sort of a live conversation can only happen on, um, on Wednesdays. Tim, can I talk to that? Yes, please do. Um, I see that the, a little bit later, the Bowdens sort of follow up on that question having to do with uh, cohorts being split apart. Um, and on the Wednesday classes, as you mentioned, uh, it, depending on how the teacher works it, it could easily be the whole class. I know a lot of us are thinking about those Wednesday lessons as being great places for class discussion. Uh, and in that case, the cohort A and the cohort B kids would be there together. Um, and also, you know, the homework that students are doing, the assignments that our students are doing, the students would, even though they're in cohort A and cohort B, they'd be doing the same tasks. And they might be doing them at a slightly different schedule, but a lot of conversation, a lot of homework is stuff that lasts for more than a couple of days. And so, yeah, students in cohort A and cohort B would still be able to work together and work with each other, encouraging each other, discussing with each other that work. Uh, there's another thing, from the Canvas program, the learning management system that I think a lot of teachers will be making use of. And that is there's a, there are discussion boards within Canvas that allow students to discuss with each other assignments and things that they're gonna be doing. And people can do that cross cohort. And there's also capacity with Zoom and within Canvas for students to do video conferencing with each other to uh, between cohorts to talk with each other. And I guess I'd kind of say there is a little bit of a time delay with cohort A and cohort B. But if I had, like last year, I had two U.S. history classes. And I had one class at met period three and one class at met period five. And the kids in those two different classes found plenty of ways to talk with each other about what they were doing. So in a way, cohort A and cohort B, I think are kind of like being in two different class periods. I think the kids will still have plenty of chance to interact with each other. Thanks, and David, do you want to um, address Jennifer's question, which is in between the Bowden ones about homework? Sure. Um, yeah, so one bit, I suspect that a lot of teachers between the first day on campus and the second day on campus, Monday and Tuesday for cohort A and B, that there will be homework. It will be a normal school day and there'll be homework in between those two. Uh, on the off-campus days, uh, a, some of what the teachers will assign or ask students to do when they're off campus will be time bound um, because 
not all of it will be, but some of it will be because one of the things we found last year is the more loosely structured assignments, tasks, and things were for students, the more likely a lot of students were to go completely off schedule and you know do stuff in the evenings and wait until the weekend or wait until next Friday or something or other. We don't wanna regiment every moment of the off-campus days, but we will have the capacity to say to those students, okay, you're off campus today, but class is between nine and 10.30 and there's a video that you can see through Canvas during that time period. Or the discussion boards that I mentioned. I think I'll use this in my US history class a lot. That on class time on Friday, those of you who are in cohort A, you will have a discussion through Canvas with each other about the reading and talk with each other about the reading just as if it were regular class time. So I think you will find that some of the time, I don't know what percent, I bet it's gonna be like 30% of the time that students have to spend on their off-campus days will be sort of time restricted, doing something during the bell schedule. But then some of it will be kind of freely scheduled homework and activities for them to do with their own pace. Great, thank you. Um, next question I see is about families with internet access at home. Uh, we found that last spring there was, I don't remember the exact number, but it was between 20 and 25 families did not have good internet access uh, and we obtained um, iPhones for them to use as hotspots and for those who needed a plan, we did that. So we are doing that again. Um, some of those students were seniors and graduated and we have a new class of ninth graders. So I am anticipating it'll be about the same number, but um, I'm appointing someone to be our remote learning coordinator. Uh, and that person among some other things will be the point person for families that have connectivity issues um, or uh, whether it's they don't have access or, um, or other challenges. So uh, we will be providing that. Um, so, uh, David, we got a lot of academic things. There's a question from Michelle about grades, posting to PowerSchool or Canvas, and will parents have access? Yep, parents will have access to Canvas. Um, there's a, there's a, something called an observer on Canvas where people can be observers of specific students. So parents will get access to be an observer of their students' accounts, and they will be able to see uh, the students' grades and homework activity. They'll also be able to see a lot more about the homework and assignments for their students than there was available on PowerSchool. A lot of teachers will essentially be putting the whole assignment in Canvas, whereas in, in PowerSchool, you know, you just had the name of the assignment. Next week is do the worksheet. But a lot of parents, parents will be able to see a lot of the worksheets on Canvas. Uh, Canvas, I think, for parents will be even easier to use than PowerSchool. PowerSchool will still be the repository for end-of-term grades and transcripts and things like that, but on a day-to-day -day basis, parents will be looking through Canvas. Uh, we will be getting, at, getting parents information about how to get into Canvas sometime in the next couple of weeks. So, yes, there'll be full access. Thank you. Um, there's another question about m &H, so I'm going to answer that. And then um, I don't know how many of you know Kristen LaPlante. She is our food services director. And uh, Kristen, after I answer the m &H one, if there's anything you'd like to add about lunch or whatever, please do so. So um, again, there, there's no opportunity now during the school day for students to go to m &H because we don't have a lunch period per se, nor a break. Um, so. Um, and I'll, I'll confirm again with John that students shouldn't be there. As I said, I did have a conversation with him, but there's just not the opportunities that there were because of the way our schedule works now. Um, so Kristen, is there anything else you'd like to add about lunch or food services stuff? Um, I'll just take a quick second to reassure folks that we're gonna do everything we can to give kids as much choice 
um, at lunchtime as we possibly can. We'll always have a vegetarian option if, if your students are vegetarians and we'll have a non-vegetarian option for those kids who um, prefer that. So we're gonna work with the kids and get their feedback as we, as we motor through the year. Great, thanks Kristen. You know, one of the things that I know you all appreciate is there's literally not a single aspect of, of having school that's not affected from this and from very big things like what kind of a schedule do we have or how do we do lunch since we can't do it anything like we used to down to what I'll say are smaller things like, well, what about water fountains? And um, um, the fifth group of 15 people who've been working on this all summer have really done a great job. I think we've thought of, every, of everything. But as always, if you know you ever have questions or concerns, hope you'll, that you'll let us know. Um, so study halls, how will they be kept at safe distance? Those will be done the same way as in classes. So um, we will spread kids out uh, amongst different rooms and in um, larger rooms so that they're at least six feet apart from each other. Uh, so if you've come to our campus in the past, try to take out of your head the image of what you've seen because there'll only be half the students there. And so if you're thinking, well, I used to walk through a study hall and there might be 30 kids, there won't be 30 kids there um, because only 15 of them uh, may be on campus who have studied all that period and they don't all have to be in the same place. So um, we're, we'll make sure that we're consistent in study halls with um, everything else. Um, so there's a question about the, the resource room. Um, will it be allowed to travel to that room as needed for tests? Um, the short answer to that is probably not. So with longer periods, some of the time constraints for students who needed extra time are, um, they're really not there in the same way because our parent periods are now 80 minutes um, and we may need to do more assessments um, electronically that can take away the time constraint. For students who have 504 plans and IEP plans, we absolutely will be meeting all of those. Um, and, but that is a bit more an individual basis than, um, than in the past. So I know that may not be a great general answer. Um, I can certainly answer privately more specifically or Lori Wessel, our special education director, um, also could do that. Jim, can I mention something? You absolutely can. Um, one of the things that Canvas can do for assignments that students are doing at home. So if I give an assignment that I have students do at home through Canvas, it can be an assignment where I don't set a time limit on it. I have every right to do that, and I will usually do that personally as a teacher. But it's also through Canvas electronically, people will be able to do work on Canvas, and teachers can set time controls on it if they want to. So that the students could be do a, doing a writing assignment that the teacher wants them to do in 30 minutes because the teacher is practicing timed writing or something or other. So they can actually set the assignment so that once the student starts it, they have to finish it within 30 minutes or they're done. Just like in the classroom where I might say after 30 minutes, okay, turn it in, come on kids, time's up. Canvas can individualize that for students where I can give 30 minutes to all of my class, but that I could choose to give somebody 45 minutes individually. Only that individual would know that, it doesn't show up amongst all the students, um, but you can uh, allow students to have more time if it's appropriate or if it's necessary as an individualized thing, even remotely, just like I'm able to do that in the classroom with a kid right in front of me. Thank you, David. Two guesses who spent more time learning how to use Canvas, David or myself. Okay. Although I'm teaching a class in I think the second quarter, so uh, I need to get up to speed. Um, uh, then there's a question about phys ed. So according to Mr. Kane, phys ed is going to be going outside nearly every day. Uh, obviously, there are days when because of rain or cold, that's not possible. Um, and so 
in a detailed way, I can't answer that. You could reach out to Dan, but again, there's certain guidelines that we have from the state about how to run physical education classes. Um, off the top of my head, the physical distancing is increased from six feet, I think, to 14. Um, so there are, other, there are other protocols that we will follow when we do need to be, um, we do need to be inside. When students are on campus, this is Jens. I know, I think you can all see this, so I'm just, I'm reading here. Will there be issues with teachers and students hearing each other clearly? Um, can they switch to online learning entirely if there are issues they need to? So to answer the second part, yes. So nothing is, is a, a commitment for the year. Either a student who starts on campus and then perhaps for this reason, uh, or there may be others, says I'd like to switch to remote, that's absolutely possible. And a student who started in remote, they or their family may say, for example, it seems to be going pretty well. I, I feel more comfortable now and I'd like my child to now start to be coming to campus. So yes, that's always possible. Um, in some ways, those changes are easiest at the quarters, but that's not required. So um, that would just be a matter of letting us know we'd like to go to a different option. Uh, as far as the hearing question, um, I just don't know. You know, I've said to a lot of people that right now we're, we're at the point where I think we have a good plan. It's a thorough plan. I showed you pictures regarding the campus already, but until we have students coming here, we won't know which parts work really well and which parts need adjusting. Um, that's another benefit, frankly, of bringing the classes only one grade at a time because that's an even smaller number who are here initially and we can then um, see how it's going. Uh, you know, I'm getting very used to wearing masks and in general, I have not found that hearing is uh, a problem even when I've been in a, in a uh, room you know, with um, multiple people. Um, but that may be some challenges. Um, we will just have to see how it goes and, and again, make whatever adjustments that we need to make. Uh, so there's a question about the hallways um, and will there be someone assigned to each hallway? Uh, this too is a, is a place we'll see how it goes. So initially, yes, we'll need to have lots of people around to remind students to get in the habit. Um, again, I, I think that um, when we asked some students and started to run elements of our plan by them and say, you know, what do you think and what's going to be hard for you? They did feel the physical distancing part will be the most difficult. Um, and so we are going to need to have more of a presence than in the past, uh, at least initially when we're getting everyone in the habit um, to ensure that's the case. We will, you know, hallways will be marked um, with clear markings on the floor, what six feet look like. Uh, and uh, a stripe down the middle so that we have one-way lanes and um, you know our stairs are tight so students just have to move through them quickly and not stop so that they're um, not spending any more time on the stairways than they need to uh, but we'll see I do think that most students in the end will be very cooperative because I think they'll understand that the only way we can continue to have students on campus is if we do these things and no one gets sick. So there's, there's a high motivation for them. Uh, it's one of the things that we'll be talking about is the point of all these procedures is yes, so no one gets sick, of course, but secondarily, it's the only way for us to have you all on campus and you all want to be here and we want you here. So I do think that there's a, there's a lot of, um, self-interested motivation, even though some of these things will be hard. Um, Nikki, while you're waiting, is there anything in particular you'd like to emphasize about the um, kind of health and safety part of things? You don't have to, and I know I'm throwing this at you unexpectedly, but we have a moment here. I think you've covered it, Tim. I don't know if anybody has specific questions for me, but um... I think we've gone over the big things. 
Well, as an old classroom teacher, I've, I've gotten very comfortable with little wait time. So I'm going to wait a little bit longer before saying, looks like we're um, done. And uh, again, I want to emphasize that a lot of people have um, put a lot of time in trying to figure this out. Uh, that doesn't mean there might not be things that either don't work the way we anticipate or that we didn't think of. So another touchstone of our plan I didn't talk about is monitoring how it's going and making adjustments as needed. So we'll be doing that uh, as the adults on campus and I'll be asking parents and kids for feedback um, as well. And our committee that we met over the summer, sometimes at least two times and for um, a lot of people three times a week. We'll continue into the fall um, and that will be the place where we'll be saying, how's it going? Do we need to make adjustments? Um, so there's a question about the end of the day and um, queuing for buses and waiting for rides. Uh, again, we're going to need to have a greater adult presence in the past and we'll have markings on the ground um, in order to indicate to students where they need to be. And some of that we will figure out, like what's the best way to do that to make sure that there's not, um, that there's not piling up. Um, I know that the bus drivers and buses will be going over, you know, their own protocols for getting on and getting off and washing hands and everything. Um, but we will, um, in fact, Libby Rosemeyer, our assistant head of school and I were talking about this earlier today. Uh, we're going to need more adult presence the start of the day and the end of the day than usual because there's more things to be on top of. So here's, here's another, um, another good question. If everything goes well and numbers stay low in our community, would GSA look to have all students back on campus all five days at some point in the year? So, um, we would all love for it to be safe to have everyone on campus. So the moment that that's the case, maybe not the moment, but um, so yes, our, our, our decision to go hybrid was driven by the fact that we currently couldn't meet the minimum requirements um, for mostly physical distancing and, and a couple other things if all our students were here. So, uh, if those requirements change, that is to say the Department of Education says because the public health situation um, has changed, so you no longer need that physical distancing, then we would be able to have everyone on campus. But that's actually not a decision that's entirely up to me because we do have some mandates, which I think are good ones, um, from the Department of, um, of Education. But my hope is that yes, we can do that, but um, I'm not betting my house on it. <laughs> you know, there's, there's, there's a lot that we'll see what happens in the next six months and it would be great. And if we can do that, we will. Um, okay, band. Uh, currently the guidelines for wind instruments as well as chorus, which we don't have, uh, are that these cannot be done indoors, which is, um, distressing. Uh, there are other musical things that students can do um, and um, they can um, you know still practice instruments at home and all but we we cannot unfortunately have rehearsals at school because it is not permitted under the guidelines um, in school buildings. So right now that is um, Again, I, I think that's probably wise, but that one's also out of our hands. Uh, and I know Mr. O is by turns devastated by that. And he's a very creative music educator. And I, I know he'll also figure out some things to be done, but unfortunately we're not gonna be able to have rehearsals and of course performances um, unless the guidelines were given um, change. There's a question about fall sports. So, the question is, at this point, will there be fall sports? So the answer is, at this point, yes. However, the main principals association, the MPA, which governs interscholastic athletics, are meeting again on Thursday 
Um, they have postponed the decision at least two times, but I think they've run out of times to postpone it. Um, and it is, it's um, very possible that they will say, um, sports can go ahead with a limited schedule. It's very possible they will say certain sports can go ahead, like tennis and golf and cross country where physical distancing is very easy, but other sports like soccer and um, volleyball and also volleyball being indoors uh, and football cannot. And I, I, I'm not going to predict what that answer is. So really at this point, the answer is yes with reduced schedules but that may change. Um, that's another one that is not entirely up to our own um, decisions. Um, what is the plan for students that travel? So students that travel will need to follow the state of Maine's guidelines. So if they travel to a place that requires quarantine or a test, they will need to get quarantined, be quarantined or have a test. Um, there are now some states Vermont, New Hampshire, Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey, that Maine does not require quarantining or a test. So if a student traveled to those and came straight back, they would not, but um, we'll follow what the Maine CDC guidelines are for, um, for travel. Um, if there is a positive test for someone on campus, we will follow the CDC guidelines. Um, and it's really impossible to say what they'll be because we haven't had one yet. Um, they'll be in charge of contact tracing. Um, they will tell us whether or not we should uh, close school for a few days or longer. Um, we are just gonna follow what the medical experts tell us on what to do. They're very responsive. Um, when we reach out, Nikki has a very good relationship with folks up there and whether it's a suspected case or um, we're not likely to be the first people to find out about a confirmed case, frankly. The CDC is probably going to be the ones who call us to say, you have a confirmed case and here's what you should do. Uh, but we will be in con constant contact with them about what's the next step that's, um, uh, that's appropriate. And we will keep our families informed. There's, as you can appreciate, there's some privacy issues that we need to be mindful of, both because it's the law and also it's the right thing to do, but also there's public health considerations. So um, we will be communicating uh, with our families about any, any cases or possible cases and, and uh, what's the next step. Uh, <clears throat> Can I add just one thing, Tim? Yes, please do. Yeah, um, so if students travel with family and the adults get tested and they're negative, then the students can come to school. I just wanted to put that out there. Um, okay. And then the, um, the main DOE and the CDC is going to give us more guidance on if there's a positive case in our school, what the steps are. But if I'm contacted by the CDC, I'm gonna start helping them with contact tracing and one thing that we're doing, because it's kind of hard to have cohorts in a high school, we're gonna be doing assigned seating in the classes. So I'm gonna be able to show that to the CDC um, just to kind of figure out if, you know, it's just certain classrooms that need to be out or if it's the whole grade. So I'll be assisting with the contact tracing in that situation, but more guidance is coming shortly on that. Right, the, the, um, the general guidance, and Nikki, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, people who have been 15 minutes or more in close proximity um, are, are the ones for whom uh, the risk is substantially heightened. So again, we will just follow what the CDC tells us about um, who needs to be contacted and what um, and what they should do. Uh, there's a question about the new absence policy. Right now there's an absence of an absence policy. Um, I'm actually being a little facetious, but clearly our, our prior policy has to change. We do not want someone coming to campus who is, we never want someone coming to campus who's ill. We particularly don't want it now, 
Um, and we do anticipate more absences. Uh, so my best answer is that will be all be made clear soon, but um, it, it can't be the same. Uh, we will expect students to be on campus the days, the hybrid ones that they're here. And if they're not, that's an absence and to be there for the Wednesday class. Uh, there's not really attendance in terms of the days that they're not here um, because their group is home. So um, I don't like vague answers, but that's the best I can give you right now. That's, uh, uh, that's when we haven't crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's on, but we know it needs to change from what it was. All right, I see it's eight o'clock and um, Unless someone is really quick typist and gets it in before I finish this sentence, I'm going to thank you all very much for joining us. I want to thank the faculty and staff who, who came at, um, at the end of what are all long days. Um, and um, the, uh, um, um, I'm sorry, a, a question came in and I got distracted. So they'll not be marked absent if they don't Zoom. Um, let me let me just say we'll we'll get something out with a lot of um, with a lot of clarity on that. Um, if a class is meeting, then students should be in attendance. But there's some challenges when it's all remote. I understand, so um, we will get clarity on that. I promise. Um, again, thank you so much, everybody. If you have questions you didn't think of, or as you think about it, you're like, hmm, I still have a question. Please reach out to me, and we will get you answers. Thanks everybody and uh, take care. I really look forward to seeing your children, those of you who have kids who will be on campus. And again, thanks to everybody from GSA who showed up tonight. I am going to end the meeting. Thank you everybody. Good night.